Okay. I so got hopefully this is going to the cloud. I, the meet, I know we didn't record last time because nobody had the login. Um, I and the time that. before that, I, I know I hit record, but I can't find it. It's not in the chaos cloud. It's not in my cloud. I, like, I don't know where it recorded to. <laughs> um, so we basically, we talked about the risk metrics, mo like building a metrics model for risk and chatted about the template as well as say what kind of questions or cases could we orient a metrics model around in terms of just selecting a couple of themes or metrics. Um, and you can kind of, you can see our notes where we went. I think there was one action item for me that I haven't done yet, which was share some of the feedback on the, the model template with the metrics model working group, um, just because that was, we could talk about that, that the whole time, but I kind of moved it on to make sure that we got to um, actually thinking about what would go into a risk, the risk metrics model. Um, but what's been fun is in addition to this conversation, um, the OSPO working group has also been talking about a, not necessarily a risk model, but looking at the consumption risk. So if you are a company, in this case, it's been led by an individual from Verizon who's trying to build a framework for assessing packages that they want to ingest into their company. And so it is somewhat of a risk model, but he's looking at it very comprehensively. So maybe four or five metrics for each category. Yeah, um, I was in that meeting. I was yeah, in that meeting. In that one. So I feel like there's a little bit of overlap there, at least in terms of which, which groups are talking about different kinds of risks. I'm just, this is mostly for, for, Vic, for Victor's benefit, who probably hasn't been in, in all these different meetings. In this working group, I feel like we, we try to be a little bit more general about risk or various different kinds of risk. Um, but in other working groups, risk always comes up because it's kind of, it's a popular topic everywhere. So I feel like the OSPO working group is another popular area where this kind of theme comes up. Um, yeah, so I, examples I of companies trying to manage or measure specific elements of risk. Um, so that was my like precursor. Um, do you want to talk through what we had discussed there or proposed and get any feedback on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. I, I laid out like uh, what I think I pulled out, like I was trying to look for the metrics mm -hmm. that were needed, needing to be developed for this model that we didn't already have. But I don't know if I pulled out the metrics or the questions. Um, those are the questions, I would say, but it's also like the question will hopefully orient us on the ideal metric. Yeah. And then the details below were specific examples of what could be measured mm -hmm. as part of that question. So we didn't really limit it to three metrics, but we limited it to three questions. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's fine. And, and some of these questions, um, like, like, I don't know, um, like, okay, governance, SBOM, and best practices badge. We have, I know we have a best practices badge metric, and I think we have an, I don't know if we have an SBOM, I think we have something like an SBOM metric, but we didn't call it SBOM at the time. And I don't know if there's a governance one off the top of my head. Well, governance, we are mostly thinking about like, is the governance model published? Is that something that's right. acceptable and available? Yeah, I actually created a, um, a issue in the OSPO book uh, about, well, I think it's a, one of the risks actually, is uh, when open source become uh, closed source. Uh, yeah, that uh, uh, seems to be uh, a major problem for a company that's using a, an open source technology and then uh, just cannot do you do that anymore? Um, yeah, that, that, I, guess, I don't know. It's, it's, it's matrix or is it, it's just one of the use case, I guess. Yeah, I feel like that kind of fits in most with this question in terms of how transparently is it governed, managed, and progressing in the community and whether or not What's implied is that it's community driven, but I think in your example, Victor, it would be a case where the community is one company that is driving it toward their needs. Um, so I guess that could also be part of it. Uh, Cause I think they're, I mean, I think 
this is not a, a secret. Uh, I work at Google. Um, and <laughs> <No>. certainly, <laughs> I mean, it certainly happens when you have a large portion of the contributing population is inside one company. And so there are often conversations and discussions happening before they hit the community. And depending on, and I think within our own company, we rely heavily on the structure of the governance model to ensure that there is no pull from one company. So when we do want to say bring something to the project, there's a process around proposing a some sort of technical proposal or whatever that is or whatever that changes. And that gets brought to the governing board and decision making processes in the project. And so ideally we like it, that, it, that's always going to happen, I think, in terms of like if you have a big team working on a thing, like it makes sense for you to discuss and get on the same page before you bring it to the community. But um, I think maybe in terms of the project going in a direction closer to a company, I feel like that that's a little bit more like elephant factor, I would think, um, mm -hmm. in terms of existing metrics, um, which I would say is slightly different than transparency. But I, I do agree, Victor, that that is an issue. Um, Sean and I have talked about it from a different perspective, like what, what was the risk of licensing changes, say, is one example of if mm -hmm. there's a company that's really put, puts all their eggs in one project and they want more control over how people are operating and or using it, then changing the license is one way they can do that. But that's, um, we've seen examples of that be highly problematic for the project and seeing the community fracture as a result. So. We were talking about that as a potential metric as well, um, but that was specifically looking at sort of change in licensing. But I think change in governance and change in sort of company influence and governance could also be part of that like same kind of conversation. Um, Sean, do you think that's, that's something that, like when you think about transparency, does your mind go there or do you see that as a separate topic? No, I, I, I... And I, I think where it came in the discussion before is that, that we have examples of a single company taking over a governing board effectively and changing the license of a project. So uh, I don't actually know if our governance document for chaos prohibits that, but I think it does. I think that's part of the LF template that no one firm can have a controlling number of seats on the board. Because that's where, like, and the example I have is the most prominent example in recent history that I recall anyway, is um, uh, open, was it Elasticsearch, um, basically doing that. And a lot of people having to switch to a fork of that project called Open Search, search open search, which, you know, caused a lot of, a lot of people in the industry to experience pain. Yeah. Um, so I'm just thinking in terms of risk, it is, I feel like that is somewhat in, in this metrics model, it could be implied in governance. Um, Cause I think ideally if the governance model is designed well, it can discourage that behavior um, by at least like limiting a single company's control in it. But that's kind of dependent on the governance model. So that could be part of the nuance of it. Like I think I just know, for example, like Istio, that's written in their governing model that the basically like decision making and leadership roles, you get a seat depending on how much your company is contributing and mm -hmm. ensure that all the companies that are contributing in the upper echelon are represented in that decision-making body. And so that's written into the, but they designed it that way, um, where I don't, I don't know if I've seen that in other projects the same way. Yeah, I, I, Chaos is the only project within which I've had a governing role at all. So, um, and we're a pretty friendly place. <laughs> So, so for example, that, that open source to, to change the closed source model, um, I guess what matrix can be used to measure the risk beforehand? It, it could be that project is doing very well, actually. That's, I mean, it's being accepted, you know, growing uh, adoption is, is in all that is regular uh, open source community health indicators is all flashing green, <laughs> everything doing well. That's when this risk become high. Right. 
uh, become so. So I guess I guess coming back to the risk, what is the highest risk? Um, I think getting open source or closed source is one risk. Licensing is another. Any other high risk possibilities? Um, Sorry, I should be writing these down. I'm going to start taking notes. So I, I like this idea of thinking, and I don't want to lose it. Um, so far, uh, the other um, chaos matrix are all nice, I, all, all useful. Um, those are all primarily for the health uh, of the project. It, it might just influence how the, you know, uh, uh, also try to, you know, make the de developer uh, contribute better or not, right? But, mm -hmm. but but in the end, it's all for, for individual organizations, whether it's a company or, or, or government agencies, to adopt a particular open source project and, and decide and use it uh, and, and use it for long term. So, so, so yeah, that's why I think when I see this title risk, I think, yeah, this actually is probably interesting. Yeah. What, what if you, what if you do, do all that work and end up in limbo? <laughs> Yeah, I think in the past we've looked at it, at least in chaos, from that perspective of participating company and affiliation, if you can measure that, and just sort of looking at the percentage of contributions by various companies, and if you can see more into the work distribution, like is it who's who's actually reviewing and merging, and that is that also from a diverse population, or is that less? Um, not from this perspective, but I think it could apply to this case too, is looking at sort of the responsivity to contribution from those outside of those affiliations. So say you're another company and you're contributing to a project um, and you're relatively new to the new to the project or community, if you submit a pull request or a bug fix or something like that, <coughs> how quickly is that actually picked up and is it picked up at all? Because um, we have seen some projects that look neutral from a broad participation standpoint, but then pull requests from outside outsiders are not really considered at the same rate as pull requests from insiders, um, so existing members of the community. And so that can kind of be a single indicator that it's more of a closed community versus an open community, um, which isn't necessarily the same as closed source, but as in terms of like trying to extrapolate the possible trajectory of this project, I think that would be an indicator that it is more closed community, which could be an indicator of more closed source. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's come up yet in, in any metrics model, like in any metric itself. I think again, elephant factor is probably the most direct one. But I, at least, those are the two things that come to mind in, in my view. But I, I'd be curious if you have any other thoughts on what else you would want to, what other indicators you could possibly look at. Yeah, I, I, um, I think, I mean, from my perspective, the, the governance model and, and how it sort of protects against that kind of behavior is important. And I, I do think that's effectively characterized as transparency. Um, I mean, that's, that, I mean, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And and I think um, I could look at the, I don't, I guess we need to look and see like uh, which of these, like I, I would say, I, I definitely know that we have licensing. Um, I definitely know we have something SBOM-esque. Mm -hmm. I don't know about governance if that exists or not. It might exist in another working group. I'm curious. Yeah. I'll give you a quick search on our website. Because I feel like that might have come up in another another space like common um, work. Because that is not necessarily a risk metric, I'd say. Do you have a governance framework? Do you not? <laughs> is that available to people to see um, as something that's, it's harder to scan for metric wise. Like, do governance files have similar naming criteria on GitHub? 
Like, I don't, I can't say that comfortably. So D, so DEI has, um, I can share this. Use Zoom. I downloaded this from the old website because I found, I, I'm actually finding it difficult to find our metrics on the new website. Um, comparatively speaking, but there, so there's a focus area for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of their focus areas is governance. And these get it board council diversity and the presence of a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And there's also, I think possibly some related metrics, um, inclusive leadership, mentorship, sponsorship, but, um, board council diversity. I'm a little bit curious if that gets at organizational diversity. Probably um, I would guess it's more demographic related than organizational. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, demographics is mentioned. <clears throat> I mean, I would, I, th yeah. I certainly think demographic diversity is a critical factor. I think the diversity we're talking about is partly that, but also partly uh, organizational participation diversity. Yeah, and that we do, again, have a metric for. Organizational participation diversity? Uh, yeah, I'm going to paste it in. I, actually, I think I think we do. We have an elephant factor metric. We do have an elephant. Yeah. Factor. So that's elephant factor. It elephant factor is that. Oh yeah, elephant factor seems like it's more of a specific ratio. If fifty percent of the community members are employed by the same company, whereas the metric that I put in the chat is more generalized and looks at a number of different metrics that are also representing participation levels from an individual company. Uh, Yes, there's also um, risk mitigation, right? So uh, even with the best governance model in place, it is possible for a startup that just got $100 million plus uh, funding and just hired all the best maintainers in that project. Uh, so regardless of the governance model, effectively it become a monopoly in that technical area. Uh, how should company to risk mitigate that scenario? So if it's, I mean, I think the it's interesting. The, if the characteristics of the project, I, I mean, I think good open source projects are ones that yeah, function open well. Yeah, open source company. Yeah. I, I've seen that even just the past few months in open source community. <clears throat> the, there are some projects that begin with a lot of participations. <clears throat> and then one of the company, it doesn't have to be start startup, just any company with a lot of cash, um, just decided they want to dominate in that area and then just hired everyone uh, from mm. that community. And so uh, even if it's still an uh, open source um, project, effectively it become a kind of a monopolized by one company. Yeah. So... I mean, it's okay actually, as long as the product continues. It's just uh, at that point, what uh, if a company, if a if a user adopt that project, what kind of risk mitigation need to be, you know, need need, need to be considered? Interesting. We don't typically cover risk mitigation, but I have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's always like the in consultation. There's the suggestion of. <clears throat> 
is it possible you to become more involved where you could have more of an active role in the community and eventual direction steering of the project as another company like i think there's always an element of how much weight do you put in but it's not oh you're not always able to grow into it so it's always like it's somewhat up to the individual and up to the community whether or not they're accepted as part of that role um and the other aspect is just like i don't know make sure that you're not pulling directly from upstream you always have a, a fork <laughs> yeah or, like i think you like I think there's natural ways to sort of break that and you want to keep track of sort of your distance from upstream and distance to the latest version and whether or not how easy it is for you to continue to upgrade toward the upstream version. But like having having a version that's working well for you now that you can always fork and take away from if, if there is that need, if there is some because there there is natural divergence in some communities um, and forks become their own thing. Um, I've also seen the opposite case where projects come together because there was too much overlap. Um, it's not always a clean process, but it, it is possible. And so I think it's like a, a company that, that is one way that we mitigate that risk is by ensuring that we always have the current copy uh, available to us locally without having to depend on pulling from third party package managers with every build. So that's, that's like a, a basic mitigation, but I uh, yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, fork, fork is probably the best way. <laughs> uh, fork and building, building in-house expertise is uh, probably the only way. If they become a critical part of the of the business, uh, yeah, uh, the, yeah. The, the roadmap. It does. It does make maintenance more complex. <laughs> like I think there's always sort of that like the trade-offs of pulling always from upstream current versions or latest stable versions to taking your own version off another path and then maintainability and ability to recognize whether or not new vulnerabilities are impacting your version is sometimes gets a little hairy because then you need to know what version you forked from and how much you've diverged and whether or not you can apply upstream patches or whether or not the vulnerability even impacts you. Maybe you've changed enough that it doesn't. So I think then for the ability to automatically detect whether or not because you can see vulnerabilities reported in whatever the available packages externally, but if your internal version looks different enough, then then it gets it mostly ends up being a flag, and then you have to go remediate individually. Mm -hmm. um, so we spent a bit of time on transparency and governance. Um, how you would react to this sort of relationship to the broader ecosystem. I know like it makes you think of like somewhat like criticality score. Actually, that's not even in here. Um, but it's also it's a little bit what we've written is a little bit more like subjective qualities, not necessarily like they're harder to measure. So I'm curious if there are things that come to mind when you see this without seeing those descriptions that would either be in line with them or divergent from them. So that, would that be related to the ecosystem question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think dependency chains are a real thing. Um, I mean, I've heard organizations starting to talk about limit, you know, somewhat arbitrary or at least um, calibrated limitations on the number of metrics in a project or the number of dependencies for a project that would be considered acceptable. Um, you know, and the, peop the people I've talked about that with say that they recognize it's arbitrary, but if uh, a, a team is, if a, a project is left unchecked against something, then the number of, the, the amount of dependencies that creep in over time can become unbearable to maintain. It's sort of interesting because I'm, I'm curious how you would even do that because I feel like they're like you look at all the dependencies but if you do the full transitive property doesn't it just like keep it's going? Tur yeah it's turtles all the way down as I think we've yeah. said before. That's interesting though I haven't heard someone take that stance I, I mean I've heard it from the perspective of individual projects in terms of whether or not they choose to import something or build it themselves. And I know mm -hmm. specific projects that 
basically don't want any dependencies. They want to be completely self-sustained in their own code base. Um, and so because of that, they are building a lot of things that they don't necessarily need to build, but it's an active choice. Yeah. So that there is no, like, then, then they don't have any dependencies and they don't have to worry about it. So like, it's, wow. it's it, it, you can make that choice, which is kind of the most extreme way to do it, but it keeps, it keeps your dependencies under wrap because you don't have any. It's like choosing to build a, a car from entirely ma hand manufactured parts as opposed to an assembly line. You used to have to do that, Sean. I know, I know, I know, but <laughs> thanks to Henry Ford, we don't. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, gosh, it, it's almost like, uh, I almost want to say it sounds very Brooklyn. You know, it's very hipster craft. It's like craft open source where every every piece is handcrafted by the makers. <clears throat> I'm, ha I'm having a hard time even imagining a world where I would have a motivation to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, remember that time before you used, could use the internet? Yeah. I mean, I was like 10, but. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I was <laughs> asked. I was writing code then. Yeah, I was asked what I thought of the internet in 1994, and my answer was, it's a fad, everything I need, I can get off of CompuServe. <laughs> I was wrong. Um, Interesting. So I looked at criticality score, not what we want. Uh, it says a project's critical score defines the influence and importance of, of a project, but they're only looking at. So basically the downstream dependencies that a project no, has. There is no dependencies at all. Hmm. It looks at how like, basically when did you start it? How long has it been since it's been updated? How many people are working on it? How many organizations are working on it? How many commits per week is it getting releases per year? Issues closed, issues updated, comments for issue, number of project mentions. Oh, here, there's a dependency count and then dependencies. So most of it is just like, is it still being like worked on by how many people, by how many orgs, and then how many dependencies it has. So I don't I don't love it. I think that's actually what I remember talking about. The, do you remember the Z score, score conversation? Yeah. Um, that was from um, Victor, if you're familiar, the researchers from Harvard partnered with the Linux Foundation researchers to look at the relative criticality of packages across multiple like popular package managers using both things like download and, and contributor count as well as pulling in usage information from I don't remember how many organizations but they were trying to characterize basically how many people or how many teams how many orgs were using it um, and so it's a somewhat um opaque calculation because they couldn't share all the data and the exact methodology, but they were trying to factor in more things than just this. Um, I think, I guess looking at the criticality metric, it's because those are things that are readily available to you. Um, but I don't know, I feel like for, for me, this sort of broader ecosystem points more at understanding the role of this project inside it, like a dependency chain to your mm -hmm. point. Like, I think that that's where my head goes as well, which is, yeah, they're they're more systematic study for sure. Actually, there there is actually I, I actually uh, um, there is actually another um, not research but a, 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 a researcher did a, some information gathering uh, and uh, let me find that uh, there's a lot of st statistics about um, the open source community, um, but there's no there's no actually um, Conclusion on that. Okay. Let me oh, find that. Yeah. I guess the who competes with it or who's highlighting that. And that it's also like maybe we say what competes with it. Because I sometimes there are competing projects. And that could also depend at sort of Yeah, I was trying to decide about the how competing thing things whether or not those would be part of the same 
ecosystem in some cases. Like, um, hmm. uh, I'm trying to think of co competing projects that share I have an example. whatever an ecosystem is. Yeah, yeah, give me an example. Uh, the multiple service mesh projects under the CNCF. The multiple what? Service mesh projects. So Linkerd and Istio are an Aspen mesh, uh, all under the CNCF. Actually, is Aspen mesh? Sorry, I have to check that one. Mm -hmm. um, but it basically, there's been multiple service mesh projects and initiatives in the same space. Um, yeah, like, see. so like I know, for example, there's like six or seven products in the Zephyr space. And Amazon is the leading one in terms of usage and Zephyr is the second leading one. Uh, and then there's three or four others. So they're part, I suppose they're part of a, a competitive, you know, a competing project, product, community framework, but people contribute, you know, there's not a lot of overlap in the individual or organizational contributors to either one. Um, and, but, but they are, they do exist in the same consumption ecosystem where you can choose to use one or the other for these, you know, end of the wire devices. Mm -hmm. I'm um, sorry, I was incorrect. There seems to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, fourteen, twenty-one, twenty-two service mesh projects in the CNCF. Wow. But I think to your point, Sean, you can't even plug and play with them. Like I think it's not like you can swap one out for another. I think there's enough difference in them. Um, weird to me is that. Before SEO came into the CNCF, there was an initiative to create the service mesh interface to try to create more conformance, mm -hmm. uh, more performance layer across different service messages. So in theory, if you use that, then you could use any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that went away. <laughs> uh, yeah, because for more for, service mesh. <laughs> yeah, for-profit entities really like um, that to be to have their customers locked into them. Um, Maybe. I mean, it's all, it's like, it's clear that there are many ways to do this. And mm -hmm. so because there is no one single project, it is, it is going to be interesting to see how, how that space evolves. Like, I think we saw that happen with Kubernetes early on, but then Kubernetes became the clear winner. And then this entire ecosystem developed around it where mm -hmm. the other ones didn't like Mesosphere ended up adopting Kubernetes later on. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things where like winner winner takes yeah, all. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> but like in the case of like understanding its relationship to the broader ecosystem, looking at any of these projects, you would look at them and say, hey, in theory they're all competing with each other in both mind share of user and potential contributor if someone's like i want to work on a surface mesh or they typically will work on the one that they use maybe i don't know how people pick what they want to work on i think it's a little combination of both but i think eventually there is going to be some consolidation um because or like i don't know because it's just like or maybe they'll go in different directions i'm not really sure mm -hmm. but in terms of how it relates to the risk of that individual project, I would say it is riskier for any of these because they have 22 competitors or 21 competitors already in the same space that support service mesh architectures on top of Kubernetes slash container-based portfolio, like application design. So yeah. like I would say that is inherently riskier because there are more things that are competing with it versus if there's only one or two, then it has a greater chance that all of them continue or one of them or ends up being the one that is, is preferred. Right. I posted that link for the um, that that research. Mm. I thought there was some conclusion about open source. Uh, it actually turned out to be just a, a data collection. So uh, not a, there's no oh, like conclusion. Yeah. Actually know about this project. I hadn't read the paper yet. Probably so, because it came out in April. Thank you, Victor. It's not a I guess it's not a paper, but a data set, you said? Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah. I, yeah, I met with some of these folks, um, Sean, back in San Francisco um, at the, the 
meeting and they were talking about this project because there was a couple of, um, Victor, there was a couple of different researchers that were attempting to, to build more data sets around governance models um, just to be able to research them in terms of the impact of a governance model and type of model on the trajectory of a community and project and whether or not they could identify various attributes, traits, design principles that led to a more favorable or negative trajectory in a project. So that is, thank you for sharing this because I didn't know it had been published and I want to read it now. Yeah, yeah if you don't know that, that's a, coming from another another community called MetaGov, which focuses on government's model. That's, that's, that's why uh, I, I also join those meetings sometimes. Uh, what that, is it called? MetaGov, M-E-T-A-G-O-V. And they, they focus on a lot of things, but in general, there are two uh, aspects. One is uh, w, W3C blockchain related technology. Uh, other side is more soft, uh, like gov governance model. Um, Sean, can you put that in the new? Oh, jeez, am I down on the wrong? Oh my God. Oops. I'm all for revisionist history, but. Uh, no, no, sorry. It, I'm actually not, but. I lost track of, oops. It's okay. I'm also losing track of where the buttons are on my keyboard. <coughs> am I sending my terrible AQI through the interwebs? I was so out of it yesterday for the record. I had to cancel meetings. Just like, turns out I can't think straight if I'm not breathing well. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've been, my my return from Japan has been rough. Like usually Asia's rough, but I don't know why this time it's really, really rough. I actually had a great time coming back from Japan. I actually was a, <coughs> a morning person for like a whole week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. <laughs> I said yeah. not usually. I tried to write it out as long as possible. I'm yeah. sorry. So MetaGov is this is this a community? Or is this a research? Yeah, community? if you search, yeah. So they they have a lot of a, a lot a lot of PhDs actually, <laughs> uh, very um, theoretical sometimes uh, into you know, what is governance model. Even like the, what is democracy, for example. What is the um, or, yeah, all kind of a research related some sort of that area. But yeah, I, I, that's why um, the reason I, jo I, I attend some of the meeting is, is really to governance model. Like what is the right, is there a real, um, what's, what's a perfect governance model? That, does that even exist? I guess that's the question. <laughs> I would say there isn't, but that's, that's my personal opinion. I think that there's a lot of people that are thinking about this, Victor. And I think at least in that meeting back in March, there's a lot of people coming back to the sort of model of the commons. Um, I'm trying to remember, I need to remember the exact name of it, but there was a researcher and there, that was proposing this like model of the commons and then people that were applying those principles to governance models. Um, let me see if I can pull up my notes from that because then I can be smarter about it in real time. But I can also help you individually if you're interested in speaking with some of the folks that are thinking about this, um, I think. Places it sounds like MetaGov is a good place to do that as well as any any folks that are on that UC Davis paper. Um, I know Seth Frey and Vladimir are on that. Um, yeah. I guess I've met. Yeah, I'm curious Three. where they submitted this for publication. Yeah. Because uh, it's it's the open source literature in, in the academy is so fractured across so many different discourse communities yeah so the governing the commons by eleanor ostrom oh yeah that's a classic yeah so that mm. was that was brought up a lot um in terms of how to apply the principles she outlines in this book to governing open source and i think looks that, like sustain wrote up a blog about that yeah, I mean the core the, the core nugget of Ostrom's book is the imagine a common grazing area that is overgrazed, and that's her tragedy of the commons, where 
everybody shares the same resources, but it, there's an incentive to have more goats because you get more goat milk and then it just becomes in, overgrazed. Just, just in case you're interested, I post the Medigov uh, meeting calendar. <laughs> Right. Did you post it in the Yep, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the chat. Well, thanks for sharing this. I didn't know this community existed, so I think it's great to know. Because I think um, we as a company generally have these conversations with, like, say there's a new project that's thinking about releasing itself as a project into the community. Um, that's often where our team is brought in for consultation on just say like, how are you going to make decisions? How are you going to allow people to work on this with you? What requirements do you have? And basically working through those project leads on creating at least some basic elements of governance um, and as, as well as like a starting point, but it also does need to evolve over time. Like I think um, I love following the progression of the Kubernetes organization just because it's gone from just, I don't want to say like hundreds to tens of thousands of people working on it. And there are some examples where we're starting to see where the models are working well or not working well because of the sheer scale of the project. And it essentially confirming that, it, it, I guess this is sort of my it depends answer for governance models. I think there are key things that all governance models need to have, but there does need to be some element of reflecting the needs of the community in your governance model and acknowledging that the size, structure, makeup, and organizing principles within your community should guide what your governance model looks like. like I think um, something we've been talking about, Victor, in our chaos weekly calls is actually updating the chaos governance model. So that might also be interesting for you to see um, and just in terms of how at least Don's been working on trying to update it and ensure that everyone in the community as well as the governing board is on board with everything that's in there. Um, and it's not just about how rules are made, but also say outlining how individuals are promoted up into maintainer leadership or governing board positions in the community and how we think about growth development and expectation of those positions. And it goes beyond just decision-making and sort of structure of the project to understanding how how to work with us and if you want to do more in the community how you do that with us um so i think it's one of those things where it is sort of a choose your own adventure but um i am curious to see how research in this space can help us better design these things like i think like i i'm, I'm curious to see what this metagov space is like and thank you for sharing it because i'm going to pass it off to some of my colleagues that are in those roles where they're actively meeting with our project leadership on governance structure and model. Uh, and so I think it might be interesting for them to see that these, these conversations are happening in other places. At Google have uh, done a lot of good things to the open source community for sure. Yeah. In including the research, the such as, I know, is Dora a, a, a Google project? Is, it's, it's, a, it's an, a, is, is Dora DevOps, um, report is that a google report or is it just um, on google yeah so it was a, another company that was acquired by google so now it's part of our research sure. portfolio um but it's distinct from open source like dora focuses a lot on devops metrics and benchmarking for developer teams within companies um so actually I just, at one of the presentations that i loved a couple of years ago i did a presentation with one of the leads on dora um, sort of offering a view of how to evolve Dora for open source, um, recognizing that that sort of basic assumption of a team and shared incentives as team members working for the same company, those assumptions go away in the community and sort of thinking about how that would impact the types of things that you want to measure to achieve the same goals around understanding participation, engagement, and sustainability, reactivity, quality of release, and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So Dora isn't an open source project per se, but it is a research community within Google. Is there a link for Dora? Um, we can link Dora. It's not as applicable to chaos things beyond yeah. their instance, but uh, let's see. And I think 
we're at the we're over time a little bit. Oh, I'll point out. Wow. So it it's flies when you're having fun. <laughs> uh, can I find our Dora DeWalt's page? Yeah. We don't need to find it. We can throw it in later. Oh, this is bothering me. We should have. Well, <laughs> like this whole thing called search that also comes out of our company. Is, does Google do search? <laughs> Uh, finding other yeah I, I'm, dora dot dev looks like the most promising does this look yeah. familiar yeah uh yeah i think that's it dora dot dev because at the end it does say Dora is a program run by google cloud so this is i think it's the official Dora website all right there we go it's in the notes and I bid you all farewell until two weeks from now. Thank you. And thank you, Victor, for showing up and participating. It's always yeah. nice to have you thank folks. Thank you. Have a, have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.